Hello and good morning. My name is Blue Goat Bard, and today is another Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition setting design stream. Today, we're going to be talking about, um, again, we decided last week that we're going to start large and work our way in because that's how my brain works, and this is my setting, so I've got to figure out the best way to put it together. That being said, this week, we're going to start about as large as you can get. We're going to start with the gods. We're going to talk about the big players in the universe, um, how they're designed, how they fit together, and how that is going to affect the world around them. Now, forgive me, here in Oklahoma, allergies are going crazy. We've had more tornadoes than the rest of the world combined, and it's kicked up everything, pollen, mold, you name it, it's in the air. I'm struggling today. That's okay. We'll get through. So... Why are we talking about the gods? Well, so here's the thing. Um, gods have an extraordinarily large influence on the world of D&D. So there's a few assumptions that the game makes about a setting. A lot of the times it assumes that the world is very old. It's ancient. It means that... Um, Civilizations have risen and fallen over and over again throughout thousands and thousands of years, this leaving ruins and uh, magical events and cataclysms and dead zones and places where the, weir uh, the rules work a little strange. But honestly, what it, what it does is it makes the world a big, mysterious place to live in. Second, it also um, assumes that there is a wilderness, a large unsettled portion of the world outside the cities that most people don't know about other than through rumor. Um, the towns might be big and they might be safe and well-contained and uh, opulent and, you know, operate at a high level, but outside those walls, if you go too far, good morning, Special K. Outside the walls, if you go too far, things get a little dicey. Uh, nature has taken over, great monsters roam, eldritch evils exist, dangerous traps and dungeons. That's an assumption. But another assumption that the game makes is that there are a number of gods in the game and that they play an active or at least a meaningful part to play in the way the world unfolds. So, what does that mean? Well, multiple gods. That means that there are different groups with different agendas driving towards specific goals that are oftentimes against one another. And they have their own factions that they employ to uh, chase those goals. And in doing so, those factions oftentimes uh, clash against one another. Now, it also means that they tend to communicate with their followers and have some level of impact on the world. Now, whether or not that means they live in the world and they walk amongst the people, or they exist somewhere else in the cosmos and watch remotely and react in remotely to what's going on, that's really up for debate. Um, deciding on that does affect certain ways that the world will lay out. If the god is a a present part of the world, then people can go see them. They they have a much more substantial connection to divinity, which means that they um, they tend to believe more and follow more, and uh, they tend to everyone tends to fall into a religion versus possibly just kind of ah. Uh, Maybe the gods exist, maybe they don't. I'm going to live my own life type situation. Let's see, where are you? Insert, where's the break? Edit. No. Insert. Probably like at the top and I can't see it. Insert. I bet it is. You silly thing. Huh. Oh well. Okay. Okay. Back to it. So, if the gods are distant, people tend to 
believe or acknowledge that there are powers out there that they don't really understand and and they tend to pay homage to them when necessary but unless people are going to directly seek out and connect only those with the highest levels of belief and the highest um the highest morals and faith are going to actually commit themselves to that pantheon so we need to decide well actually let's get ahead of myself hey what's up two gun yeah appreciate the lurks so why are we not just going with the traditional dungeons and dragons pantheon that exists in the book now it's it's well established it's 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 spelled out very very specifically it's existed through multiple editions with very few changes in fact we can even draw on multiple different pantheons that um that play upon actual real world religions there's norse gods in there there's egyptian gods uh, i even think there's asian gods in there too in, in some capacity um but then there's the traditional uh, gods from settings um, that have been around in D&D for years. Why? Why don't we use those? Well, I could. I have. I've done that a lot in the past. And it works okay. And this is probably my fault. I'm going to take responsibility for this. My major issue with the pantheon that exists in D&D is it's just too big. See, when you have one god, or three gods, or five gods, it's a lot easier to look at that god and say, okay, what's this god all about? It's about this, they're about this, this is their symbol, blah, blah, blah. You can remember them because there's very small amounts of the gods, but the problem with Dungeons and Dragons, as it exists right now, the pantheons are huge. You, you have upwards of 15, 20 gods in one pantheon sometimes. And if I were to say to you, hey, what the god here, what's his symbol, what's, what's his... Uh, what, what, what is his um, his element? What, what's he all about? Is he What's his alignment? And what um, uh, divine domains does he grant to clerics? You may or may not be able to just rattle that off. Um, if you're a good DM, if you're really good at what you do, you probably have those gods memorized, and that's cool. But if I start asking you things along the lines of, well, tell me about his churches. Um, where would you find his followers? Um, what... What sort of efforts do they take in the world? Um, what kind of races tend to worship them? As I start getting more and more specific, things get a little bit fuzzier. And as far as I'm concerned, when it comes down to it, if you can't figure out a way to connect this God, aside from its general beliefs and, and design, if you can't connect it to the real world that the characters reside in, unfortunately, you don't have a useful, um, a useful tool. Because when the players go from town to town or dungeon to dungeon, wilderness to wherever, they need to be able to interact and encounter things that represent those gods in a way that is meaningful to them to, to prove to them that this god exists in the world. So what ends up happening for me is my players, the only time they really interact with the god is A, if it's part of the established campaign that we're in, probably a published module that spells it out for me. Uh, B, they end up taking um, as a as a priest or a cleric a specific god and therefore know a little bit about them. Um, or I have to employ uh, a god that is opposed to that cleric into the game. Those are the only times that I or my players ever encounter the gods because there's just too much. I'm, if you're in a town, I have to choose between 15, 20 gods to represent if necessary, if I want to even bring them in. And I don't want to have to sit down when I'm, you know, describing the town and talking about where they're going and what they're what they're experiencing. I don't want to think, okay, what god do I want to inject in here right now? Well, this one doesn't make sense. Ladhander, maybe. What about St. Cuthbert? Okay, possibly. How would that happen? I don't want to do that. I don't want to think about that. That's, there's too much. So when, when you start getting into too many gods, it becomes too much work. And, and it's great that all that depth is their depth, but it, if it doesn't get used, it's worthless. So my thoughts, because I ain't that smart, and frankly, I don't want to have to put that much work into it. I want to front load the work and do as much design as possible ahead of time so that later um, the gods are logically placed. They're easy to pull up and think about where they're going to be. And 
I can also leave it to my players to be able to find, to seek out and find what's there because it's easy to remember. So, I got a new toy. I want to show this off. Check this out. So this is, this is a Wacom tablet. So how it works is it's like a mouse with a pen. So I can, I can like draw on it and it draws in paint. So I've got paint open at the bottom. I've added that because I want to be able to draw things out and show you what I'm talking about. And if you look down there now, you're going to notice, uh, five colored circles. And if you're really quick, you can probably pick out what that belongs to. Um, I do need to do a quick shout out real quick to um, the Angry GM, his website. Uh, let's see, I, I believe it's angrygm.com, if I remember correctly. Uh, he has been blogging for years about Dungeons and Dragons design and dungeons and dungeon building and what rules work what rules don't and you know he, he's a little harsh to listen to but the man knows his stuff and he inspired me to make this change uh, now there's a lot of things that he does that i don't specifically agree with but this was one thing that kind of got me going now to get back to it the symbols down here that you see i don't know if i can show i need to figure out how to show my cursor so i can just like point I wonder if I can background. How do I do the background? Click. Where's the click? There it is. Background. Filters. Edit. Can I do a cursor? Is there a possible I can just show my cursor? Chrome key. Dang it. Somebody who actually knows how to do things might have to help me out eventually. Uh Damn. Oh well, we'll figure it out later. Anyways, so Angry GM. This symbol down here at the bottom, the uh, red circle, black circle, blue circle, green circle, and white circle. This is the traditional emblem of Magic the Gathering. Stop making noise. Go out there. Dogs. Now, Magic the Gathering uses an element system. There's five elements sometimes in cooperation, sometimes in uh, opposition to one another. And what makes this interesting, there's five of them. So let's say you look at red. Red is adjacent to uh, white and black, which means that in some ways, red can ally themselves with black or white to become more powerful or, or to, to grow together so that they can fight together. So Unfortunately, red has the enemies of blue and green. So if you look across, that means that there are two separate um, factions that actively oppose red. So if those two were to join together, <coughs> what would end up happening is that red would likely be overpowered because blue and green together are stronger. So what red does, red can reach out to one of its allies and um, make an alliance a temporary alliance in order to fight off the other factions. Now, what's interesting about that is no matter who Red chooses, that ally is also allied with someone across from them, with, with one of the enemies, but it's also opposed to. So it's a strange balancing act because no one can really get a leg up on the other because there are two opposers and two allies. Um, and then no matter who you employ as an ally, they will also have two allies and two opposers. So what ends up happening, each of these things are held in this, this tenuous balance from one another, related to and opposed to all of the others. And this keeps everything in check. Now, if you'll remember correctly, in... Uh, previous week the players upset the status quo dang it it didn't show it there we go the players upset the status quo the status quo in dungeons and dragons in my opinion is extremely important what the status quo is is it's the balancing act of the setting it's the the forces at play 
um, all around that are opposed and allied with one another that are all competing in such a way that everyone is, a, is at a stalemate. The setting is going to stay the same. It's not going to move forward per se without the interjection of the players. Now, that is important in my opinion in a sandbox. Now, if you start getting into a, a more story-based campaign, uh, the players, the, the status quo is already upset and that's what's driving the players forward. But in a sandbox, it's important that things tend to stay a little similar. And the reason for that is, is it makes it a lot easier to manage as a, dungeons, a dungeon master. And it gives the players a sense that their actions matter. So what we have here in Magic the Gathering are these five separate elements and each one has their own sort of features, uh, their own attributes. So green is all about growth and big things, whereas blue is about control, um, uh, magic. Black is about death and undeath. Red is about direct damage. It's um, lightning bolt, for instance, is the iconic red card. Uh, and then white is all about life and small numbers, armies, cooperation in a sense. Now each of those things together um, they have their own way that they will exist in the world. And then they can play off each other. Um, like green tends to believe in nature with hordes of things, whereas white is more like hordes of organized small creatures, um, so forth and so on. So they, they all kind of share similarities until you start looking at the opposition, which the classic one, of course, is white and black, life and death. So... Um, red and green opposed to one another whereas you know red tends to use big creatures to do damage whereas i'm sorry green does red tends to use magic uh spell casting to directly attack and destroy things so you can see where the similarities lie and the connections are and the oppositions lie now how does that actually play into the gods and and our setting design well to answer that i'll be right back Oh, forgive me, I brought the wrong computer in today. I have a little laptop that I use for all of my writing. And I didn't bring it in today. Okay, so. Get off. You're so annoying. Go away. Eggs. So. Oh. How it comes into play. It's possible if we really tried, I'm not going to. We could we could boil each color in Magic the Gathering down to two major attributes. Um for instance, I've already mentioned it. Uh, green is, we'll say, hordes, and we'll say growth. We'll say big creatures, and or hordes and growth, we'll say that. So, the way that I want to think about this, the way that I want to express this, is if you take one of those attributes and you take its opposite, you can put that opposite against and onto either red or black since they're opposite. So it, it might be easier for me to just say this. I'll type this out. There we go. Now we're on a new page. How's that look? Okay. So by framing these things as opposites what you're doing is you're putting a versus structure in so for instance one of the attributes of white is life now 
Very obviously, the opposite of life is death. So you can take white life versus death. And that's one attribute of white. Now you have one attribute of death. Now, death and life, both of them are going to need another attribute whose opposite is going to be possessed in their verses. Now, what this does is this sets up a, a system of opposition amongst your gods. Now, so let's do this. Where is my cursor? There. So, what this does for us is that makes it makes it to where our gods are. They're carefully designed. Um, they are. They represent very specific things in the world, and their opposition to their brothers and sisters are represented. So, here's what we're gonna do. We have five gods, and I'm typing on my. Oh my gosh, on my actual computer. Oh my god, not on my keyboard. I'm a moron. Okay, five gods. How's that showing up over there? Good. Five gods. Each god has two attributes. Each attribute has an opposite in a competing god. Okay. Five, the reason I picked five. First of all, five is a great number. Uh, it, it's it's not too few that I won't be able to really differentiate where my gods are in the world and have a bunch of com uh, competitors. But it's not too many that I can't remember what the hell they're all about. I like five. It gives players options. Plus, this will be important later. There are roughly 8 to 10 domains in 5th edition. So, I'll go into that soon. So, I need to figure out what the attributes are. So, the way I can do that is I can think of traditional... Um, traditional ideologies in the, the real world. So, let's go with... I'm still on my computer again. Oh my god, I'm so silly. I gotta get this out of my lap. Otherwise, I'm just gonna sit here and type crap in all day. Alright, let's eat this egg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Clean my plate, dogs. Okay. So, five competing ideologies. Now, life and death. That one's easy. Okay. What was that? Making noises. Hey, thank you for the follow. Oh, that reminds me. I need to move that to the back. And thank you for revealing my uh, mistake there. Where is that? Paint. You can go all the way down to the bottom. There we go. That was... Who are you? Regex Buster. Thank you for the follow. Getting me one step closer to that 100. I appreciate that. All right. Let's get back to this. Provide some value to y'all. See if I can actually get through a, uh, a discussion point today. Okay, so... We also have... Let's do supernatural, like magic. Get off. God. Versus nature. Okay, how about free will 
versus um I think I think I chose tradition or is it fate that I did I think I did fate free will versus fate and then I did tradition versus change um i thought about that um i think i think i what i ended up with was something very close to that let's see let's see what i got tradition nature because i'm missing i'm missing two oh community and the individual that's what i went with I think I started with War and Peace and I decided I could wrap those into other um, ideologies. So the reason why I went with these. So each of these is something that we all kind of understand when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons and even the real world. Life and death, pretty straightforward. Supernatural versus nature. The things that happen in the world that are a result of natural forces and the things that come from outside the, our domain, uh, the magic, God, whatever you wanna call it. Free will versus fate. Is this something that um, I control as a person? It's like, I make my choices and I go forward and that's what shapes destiny or are things preordained? Um, are, are things written in the stars and there's nothing I can do, there's no way I can fight to get past that. Tradition versus change. Tradition as a sense of, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way we're going to continue to do it. We have reasons, but it doesn't matter because doing it is the important part. And then versus change, it's, you know, basically the 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 age-old D&D argument of law versus chaos, in a sense. And then community versus the individual. This is something we deal with a lot in the world. It's, it's uh, the idea of how much of myself do I need to sacrifice for the good of the community versus how much of other people can I sacrifice for the good of myself, in a sense. So I, I picked these because, again, they're pretty obvious and they're very easy to assign to a god. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to pick two of these, put them together, and that's gonna make a god. So, and I'm gonna keep doing this and then I'm gonna use that as a starting point. I'm gonna pick one and I'm gonna start with that and then I'm gonna use that one to help design all of the other ones. So, here's what I came up with. Erastus, god of the supernatural and free will. Now, the reason why I put those together is I wanted some form of being, some magical wellspring that was the, the maker of all things. That, and not necessarily all things, but maybe just the soul. So this is the guy who has access to the weave, the magical weave, and where all magical energy initially comes from. And he's also the guy who instantiates the soul into the world. Now. I can go on and on about him and what he controls and what he's all about, but I really need to take those, I need to take this and I need to make the other gods first. And then I can kind of start uh, fleshing them out per se. So let's go ahead and take, so we've got Supernatural, we'll go ahead and highlight this, bold it out, and Free Will. So. Now we wanna look, so we have nature and fate as the oppositions. So the next God that we create needs to have one of those. Now, to me, fate and death kind of go hand in hand. So I'm gonna do him next or her. And then we inexplicably lost power. We now return you to your regularly scheduled 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons stream. 
Ah, that's right. So we had just made Erastus the god of free will and supernatural, master of magic and the origin of the soul. So I decided that fate and death sound very much like something that would be going together on a god. So then we have Kek, god of fate and death. Now, here's a guy that's oversees law, justice, inevitable, the darkness. He represents cause and effect. He's the protector of the dead. Um, he's very passionate. It's cold, logical. Um, he ushers the dying to the next world, but he's both the executioner and a guide. Um, so now we have a god that is in opposition to our god of the supernatural. Now, notice he's not He's not the opposite of Erastus in the idea of life. Erastus makes free will, he makes the soul, but he doesn't really care about life itself. Which means he may, he probably is also the patron of ghosts, specters, disembodied souls, that sort of thing. Now, so, nice. Uh, so we have still nature. So what is the opposite of nature? What would be something, or what what is what could I put with nature that would make sense? And I decided to go with tradition. See, the thing about nature is Ashaval god of tradition and nature the thing about nature is is nature does its thing it's always done its thing it's going to continue to do its thing and regardless of whether man comes in and screws it up it's going to try and get back to doing its thing now the thing about tradition is generally speaking things are done for a reason now that reason might be lost throughout the annals of time but that reason is always, it, it, well, let's say it's not always a good one, but it is a good one. People start things for a reason and the tradition continues because it's trying to accomplish a specific goal. And that's what happens with nature. Nature does its thing, continues moving forward. It has a very good reason for what it does. And that reason is, is because it works. Now, the interesting thing about nature is, and we're learning this nowadays in the real world, the reason's not always clear. And sometimes the rote, the repetition happens and it seems to just happen because that's the way it's happening. And it's not until we go in and mess with something, something small, that it completely screws up the whole thing. And that goes really well with tradition because a lot of the times, especially with like the idea of in D&D of like uh, rituals that you that you do all the time and and you never really know why, but you do them. And then the day that you stop doing them is the day that the the prison ceiling, the ancient shadow demon uh, shatters and lets loose the evil. And, you know, the tradition might have seemed kind of hokey and weird, but we did it. We had a reason and breaking that tradition has dire consequences. So now I have a story on that. Um, there's a guy, Paul Stamens, studies mushrooms, mycologist. He learned that... Um, the bees have been dying off. So here in Oklahoma, about two years ago, 85% of the bee population died. And this is going to seem really off the subject, but it's an idea of tradition and nature going together. Well, he also found that bees like to drink the juices, the waters, the condensation off mycelium, which is basically mushroom roots. Very strange. Didn't seem like it lined up with anything. Well, he was out walking through the forest one day and he found a bear strike on a tree. Now, bear strike is when a bear rises up strikes a tree basically to mark its territory, what they think. Well, the problem is, was when a bear does that, it compromises the integrity of that tree. It's not as strong anymore. It doesn't have protection. Some of its immune system has died. Uh, it's open to the elements which allow mushrooms, spores to get in there and colonize it. And there's a specific mushroom spore that gets in these trees wherever uh, Paul was. And um, 
it kills them. It eventually rots out the tree and kills them. It takes a couple years for it to set in, but it does kill them, and it's because of these bear strikes. Well, park rangers, officials, people who are running the place, they decided we needed to kill off the bears because they're a threat to the trees. So they went off and they killed like 400 bears, which is absolutely stupid. Well, come to find out that the bears, not only were they not harming the trees in actuality, they were actually very beneficial to the forest because what bears do when there's a salmon run, they go down to the water, they grab the salmon, they take them on shore or into the forest and they eat them. And the salmon decomposes, which injects very specific um, water, ocean-based nutrients into the soil that the trees would not be otherwise be able to get from the surroundings. So they're, they're integral to the health of the forest. So that's an idea of we broke tradition, we screwed up with nature, but here's what's really interesting. So there's bear strikes, they're thought to be bad. Well, Mr. Stamets, Notice that whenever you strike, a tree resin comes out, sap comes out, and bees are attracted to that. Well, when the bees go eat the resin, they're inoculated by the mushroom spores that are there. And after he did some studying, he found out that that mushroom spore is actually integral for bee health uh, in order to fight off the virus that has been responsible for killing all the bees across the country. So we go in and we screw everything up with deforestation and other things and it messes with that tradition and gets things out of whack if we would just kind of try to work with what's there work with the tradition even though we don't understand it things would work out better so that's my side tangent all right so we've taken care of six of the ten now I've got life to contend with, and I have change to contend with. So, life is easy. Let's do, we'll do life real quick. So what goes really well with life? So, in my opinion, life works really well together with the idea of community. So we're gonna say, the Sias, God of community and life. Hearth, community, birth, innocence, family. Vasias is going to be the cornerstone of civilized society and it's going to be hailed as the mother of all sentient life. Now, that actually ended up kind of cool if we think about it because Vasias is not in opposition to anything that Erastus represents. So it's quite possible that you can see the two of them, Erastus and Phasiah, getting together and using their respective powers and agendas to generate intelligent life. The soul and actual the body together in one moving forward. So that's kind of neat. All right. So if I go highlight life, community, what does that leave me with? That leaves me with change and the individual, which is really kind of neat. Pamblin. God of change and the in individual. All right. So let's go up and we'll check out a little bit that I've wrote about Pamblin. All right, now, one of my followers in here, I don't know if you're still following, if you're in here right now, uh, I think it was, was it Regex? Reg? Regex Buster, okay, was in here. Brought up the idea of war and peace. And I feel like Visayas and Pamblin are sort of the representation of war and peace. Because change individual individual that's all about getting yours it's going out it's striking out into the world and it's it's seeking fame and glory for yourself and then change is all about the growth that individuals go through and and how they're constantly becoming new people new entities in order to become bigger than who they are and that's very different um it's very different than Visayas. Uh, Visayas, in a sense, is, is, is kind of all about sacrificing the self for the good of the community and growing as a, a larger organism. Um, 
becoming more and finding a stability, a balance, so that uh, everyone can work together and prosper together. Pamplin's all about going into the world and taking what's his. Uh, warrior, adventurer, traveler, uh, the impermanent self, the youth, the constant battle with one's inner and external demons in order to grow into something more. Um, patron of war, travel, discovery, and sex. All things change, and so must we, lest we be smashed against the rocks. I've got five gods now. I've got all of their competing ideologies down. They're all in opposition. And this is the interesting part. So now that I've got them, now I can kind of talk about how they interact and oppose one another. So let's start with, heck, I've got, I've got Pamblin open here. Let's start with Pamblin. All right, so Pamblin has two allies and two um, op opposers. So let's go down here and we'll click on him real quick. So Pamblin is opposed by Asheval because Pamblin is the god of change and Asheval is the god of tradition. So they're going to clash on those aspects. Opposed. Opposed by Asheval. Um, so how would those two clash? So God of nature and tradition. Well, nature tends to be very mysterious. Uh, the truths within nature tend to lie underneath the actual actions. Um, it's all about doing the thing because the thing is important in, in some sort of outcome, but the actual meaning and the reason behind that a lot of the times is hidden. So uh, Pamblin, he wants to shine a light on all the secrets. He wants to go out in the world and discover those secrets and, and try and figure out, you know, how is this something that I can use? Is it a useful tool that I can use to further me? Or is it something that, that, is, that, that I need to be aware of in case it, you know, it tries to, to hurt me, to kill me? So Pamlin is out there trying to constantly move forward, while Asheval is all about mastering who we are, where we are. Asheval is more of a present, um, present seeking, uh, in the moment God, whereas Pamblin is all about looking to the future and moving towards it. So they oppose each other in that. So, all right, cool. Well, that's, that's good. That kind of gives me a little bit more of an idea about what Pamblin's all about. He's like, he's going out in the world and he's, he's trying to find uh, bits of knowledge and, 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 and useful tools and, and, and apply them to himself uh, to get stronger, to get better. And Asheval is always kind of fighting him because it wants to hold on to those secrets and just says, you know, do the thing, do what we say because, you know, it's important and it makes things better. Okay, cool. All right, so what else? Also, there's always the, the nature versus man type aspect. I mean, that's one of the greatest uh, competitions that, that we have faced as a people throughout centuries is it's our clash with nature and trying to master and overcome the difficulties of nature. So that's cool. So that's there. Okay, so who else is he opposed by? Well, Asheval is also opposed by Visayas. So Visayas is... Visayas is community. And part of community is that sort of reserved privacy, um, you know, don't be too extrovert, don't be too big, don't get into certain things because they, they tend to hurt the community as a whole. So Pamblin lusts after new personal experiences and doesn't shy away from lustful pleasures, right? While the more community and life-focused Visayas believes that sex should be reserved for the furtherment of the species and the family. That takes the selfish side for Pamela, the selfish aspect of sex, the feel-good nature, versus the utilitarian community-building aspect of sex, okay? Um, sex to produce life, for instance. Um, in addition, Pamblin is also too violent for Visayas, who believes in solving problems through diplomacy and cooperation rather than the sword and subjugation. That's going to be important. So that gives us an aspect to Pamblin that maybe we hadn't considered conquest. 
he doesn't just go out and seek knowledge, he takes it. He's all about going out and seeing what's out there, finding its value, and then for whatever means necessary, acquiring it for himself. Whereas Messias is all about talking to the other people that are out there and working together with them because it only hurts the community if they go to war. Someone is going to die, and it might even be all of this one community or all of the other community, but either way, there is a price to be paid. And it's not necessarily at the individual level. It is, but it's also at the much larger community level. So, cool. Pamblin, what is his ally? He's allied with Keck. Now, this is interesting. Because Keck is the god of death and fate. And you'd think that change is sort of the opposite to fate, but it's it's not. Change is, is the idea that things are going to be different from space to space, but they can still be ordained. So death is just another adventure, in a way. It's, it's, it's another tool, it's another unknowledge, another mystery to un, unwrap by the adventurous Pamela. Um, Keck encourages the individual to make the most of what little they have, for it's theirs and theirs alone. Makes the most of what little they have. For it's theirs and theirs alone. Keck is the maker of stories, but he always enjoys hearing the unique perspectives from each new soul he meets. So Pamblin goes out and writes his own individual story. And when he dies, when when a man dies, they spend time with the Reaper and they tell them, they tell him their story. Interesting. So it makes Keck seem less like an evil figure and more like of the ferryman, the boatman, the guy who, who ushers you across the river and lets you lets you extol your own story. Um, tell him your faults, tell him your weaknesses, tell him where you succeeded before he drops you off into eternity. So that's kind of neat. That that humanizes Keck a little bit, which was good. We want to make the gods. We don't want any god to appear good or evil. That's very important. They're all balanced against one another. And honestly, in a way, the concepts of good and evil are more of a human invention um, than a, a universal one. The gods themselves just do. They just are. All right. So who else is he allied with? He's allied with Erastus. Now, I think also I'm just going to unpack one of these gods uh, for now, uh, just to kind of show where I'm going with things. Uh, later, I'm going to be building a large PDF that I can release that people can, can download and read themselves, but I'm just going to kind of unpack little bits and pieces here so you understand where I'm going. Um, so Erastus. Erastus is the master of the supernatural and the free will. So. That actually goes really well with Pamblin. Um, magic is just another tool. So power is useless without a wielder. And Erastus loves to see his children using the gifts he gave them. In addition, he loves screwing with Keck by encouraging them to make their own way, to rally against fate, to cheat death. So in a way, he's playing Pamblin against the Reaper. Um, Pamblin is Erastus' greatest weapon against the Reaper. That's kind of neat. I like that. It shows a little bit of a playful nature between the gods. It's using each other against one another, but, you know, these are all brothers and sisters. They're all related. They all, they all came from the same place. And while they have their own goals, they're still, they're still related. They still love one another. Cool. All right, so... This gives me a way to represent more and more what aspects of the God are going to show up in the world. But it also makes it to where I can kind of figure out how different uh, clergy are going to, uh, and, and faithful, how they're going to interact. Um, you know, you're going to see uh, followers of Pamblin out being adventurers. 
They're going to go out. They're going to look out into the world and, and find things. And they're going to come across Visayas and Ashaval followers. And they're going to rail against one another. And, and, and we have good reason. We have defined reason for why that's going to happen now. But I want to get a little more specific with Pamblin. I want to put forth aspects. Now, if you'll remember earlier, I talked about there are 10-ish domains. Domains are the divine equivalent of power sources. They're specific themed spell lists and power lists that a cleric can attach themselves to through their god to give them extra abilities. And that's going to be, so we're talking about setting, but we also need to take into account actual mechanics too. Um, it doesn't really matter if we talk about setting and all that, if we never connect mechanics to it. And if the two can't meet, it's important to know that because we need to find a way to connect them together. Uh, otherwise, the game is going to seem weird. The verisimilitude is going to be broken and it's going to be confusing for players. They need to be able to look at something and kind of logically make a connection. So... Pamblin. We're going to design something called Lesser Aspects. Lesser Aspects are kind of an emblem of a god. Something that shows up as a sign in the world. Uh, maybe, maybe through signs specifically like Zodiac signs. I mean, we've got we got five gods, I could have 10 aspects, a male and a female for each god, and each one has an emblem, a symbol that shows up as a zodiac symbol in the world. Kind of like that. Something to mess with later. So, male and female major aspects. And then we can also put minor aspects in there, almost like intelligent beings that have aligned themselves so thoroughly with a god that in a way they have become their own power source maybe we can use that later we'll talk about that more all right the lesser aspects so the sheath This is the aspect or the ideal of the individual. Now I'm going to talk about male and female, masculine and feminine. It, it, it's more just thematic purposes. I'm not actually making a commentary on men and women or anything. I'm going to make this the feminine. So... We need a male aspect. That's weird. Why did it do that? How about the weather vane? This is the ideal of change. Masculine. I think the reason I did that is the individual is more of an internal aspect, um, where the external is masculine or ideal is the external is change. I don't remember, but part of the reason I wanted to do this is just kind of add a little bit more flavor to the world. Um, I could make it to where when you choose a domain, a lot of the times the main people that you're going to run into in the world that choose, for instance, the sheath as their ideal are going to be women, whereas um, the ones who follow change are going to be men. And that gives me an excuse to do something that I'm bad at. Um, I tend to make a lot of men in my campaign settings. Uh, it's easy, it's it's familiar to me, um, but I want to be able to get outside my comfort zone a little bit and, and do more women characters. And I think this will force me to do that uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I will generalize certain things in order to make it easier for the players to understand the world, but also force me a little outside my comfort zone. So the sheath 
is going to be the war domain. Cool. What about the weather vein? Well, that makes sense. It's easy. The tempest domain. Now, we've done a couple things by doing this. If I want to make a cleric character, I've got my gods to choose from. They're what they're spelled out, kind of what they focus on. Um, they make it real easy to pick. What do I want to follow? What ideals do I want to follow? Now, it also kind of spells out who I'm going to work with and who I'm not going to work with. I'm so that's good. That gives me a solid base for my character. When you start having all of these large lists of gods, the problem that you run into is like, how, how do I interact with everyone else? It doesn't spell it out. This is a good way to really understand where your character stands in the world and kind of what you can expect moving forward. That's good in two ways. First, it helps you build your character and understand your character better. But I think the main way that it helps is it allows you to, to express your expectations and things you find interesting directly to the DM. Because it doesn't force the DM necessarily to create situations. When you have it spelled out like this for the player, they can look at where they are and what they're up against and they can figure out how they're going to fill the gap between the two. Um, I really like that aspect. It, it, it puts a little bit of the creativity creation aspect into the player's hands and takes a little bit of the onus off the DM. And that's, that's always important because we've got way too much to do anyways as DMs. So now, then you get down to these lesser aspects. Now, I've got a choice here. Do I want these lesser aspects, these more obvious aspects, to be what most people see in the world, the commoner? Or do the commoners know the main gods? I feel like... I feel like the, the commoner would... The, sh the sailor going out on his boat has a weather vane, makes a sacrifice to it before he goes out, asking for Hamblin, provide him with favorable weather on his journey. I see the warrior stepping outside of town, kneeling at the gates, holding her sheath up to the sun and asking Hamblin to bless her travels, to keep her safe, and to guide her sword arm. So I see these aspects, these emblems, as something for the common man to rally under, to use as an emblem of their intent and their faith. Whereas the gods, the actual gods, be more the realm of the clergy, the priesthood, the clerics, the paladins, etc. The common man doesn't have a relationship with the gods. They don't speak to them. They don't need a personification of them. They just need a symbol. So I want my clerics, my paladins to pick an aspect because that's their holy symbol. You know, I want the sheath to be a symbol of the warrior. I want them to decorate it or uh you know have something very special about it you know they draw their sword they hold it out banishing the undead or maybe they do the same thing with the weather the weather vane or something but this is the this is the emblem that you're going to use to recognize to recognize one priest from another and then I have the masculine and the feminine aspect, which is going to help me kind of generalize certain sexes into the setting and force me to have to use more of one or the other. And that's fine. Now, there are other aspects. In fact, 
there are minor aspects to each. I've thought about this too. So from the sheath, there's the gladiator, which is good aligned. This is a, this is an aspect that's developed by intelligent beings that has been given power. If you notice that we go from an object to a person per se, or a type of person. And that is, that's to represent that in some way, man, through their worship and their use of these emblems over time have developed other power centers. Now, whether the gladiator itself is a thing mechanically in game or not, not really important. What I'm trying to do here is, what if you're walking through the woods and you find an altar? And on that altar is gold coins, bloody knife, maybe a severed finger, and a small statue, silver statue of a gladiator. How do you interact with that? Well, it doesn't really fall under any of the traditional emblems of godhood. <coughs> Bless me. So, what is that? Well, that allows me to make aspects and altars and sub-demigods or whatever entities that players kind of have to learn about as they go along and adds a little bit more mystery to the world. And it also adds the ability for me to have sub-villains or whatever, or interesting cults, whatnot. So we also have the blackguard evil aligned. I can use that as well. Under the weather vein, Pamblin, uh, change the traveler. Chaos aligned. I haven't decided what uh, I want to do for law, but I could do that if I want to. I don't even have to. Subdomains are not something that I have to do, but I can, and it will add more flavor to the world. Mm. So, that kind of spells out the different gods of the world and how I'm going to go about building them. Um, this gives me a good jumping off point for building organizations, understanding where certain borderlines fall between gods and, and power centers. For instance, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll talk about one more real quick and I'm just gonna read this off. So, Asheval is one that I've put a lot of thought into. Not Asheval, excuse me, Visayas, there we go. So I've got a little chapter here on where they are in the world. Often associated with light and hearth, Visayas is mainly found in towns and settlements, though it's not uncommon to find her symbols and altars along well-traveled routes as a way to grant comfort to those far from home. Okay. All towns maintain a sacred hearth flame, a protected fire of natural origins that they constantly maintain. When a new town is settled, a portion of the flame from the closest town is acquired and transported to light the new hearth flame. All individual hearths are then lit from this flame. Hearth is in uh, the fireplace in a home. It's considered an ill omen for a town's hearth flame to wane and a cursed event for it to go out. No ordinary flame can relight and extinguish hearth flame, only that from existing hearth flame. Legend has it that all hearth flames can be followed back to the first bit of fire gifted to man from Visayas herself. Now... We've used the interesting, very simple aspects of a god, the two community and life aspects, to design both lore, fluff, and uh, crunch in the game. Like, we have actual mechanics now. So, we, we've also given a way for DMs to, to generate stories. You arrive at a town, and everyone's gathered at the local temple. In the local temple, and doesn't you see the priest frantically adding fuel to the hearth flame? 
sacred oils and herbs and blessed woods, but for some reason the flame is steadily shrinking. Why? What's causing this flame to shrink? Now you have an adventure hook. Or you're in the temple when the flame suddenly goes out. In the distance, you can hear the beating of drums approaching slowly from the north. Another hook. Or maybe the flame has changed color. Or maybe, you know, the uh, the Baron wants to place a new territory to the north, but it needs a good source of hearth flame to get there. So you can't take one from the main town because it'll go out by the time you get to the new place. You got to go over to this town first and gather its hearth flame before you travel to the site. And then you have to negotiate in order to get a bit of the hearth flame. Who knows? I mean, the 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 uh, opportunities are are very wide with that and they only exist because we've put forth these little bits of uh, information and expanded upon them expanded upon them and because they work against each other you have to decide where the line lies and finding that line is really what helps you define where certain features and lie and and how they show up and how they express themselves in the world so uh I've got all of my gods written down. I've got them all typed up. I don't have them all completely defined. That is something I need to spend a little bit more time on. Um, but eventually, as we go through this process, as we expand this setting and I expand my PDF, I'm going to put it out there for others to, um, to download. Uh, I've been suggested to put up a Patreon account so that people can donate or support or whatever so I can put more time and energy into this. I do unfortunately have a full-time job. I'm a bartender uh, and I have a wife, which is also a full-time job. I have a lot of other goals that I'm getting into. Uh, I'm doing a lot of different streaming during the week, horror games, survival games. I'm doing a reading. Uh, I'm about to start reading a horror book late at night to you know, lull people off to sleep. Um, but, and I, and I grow food, I grow, I have a garden, I grow microgreens, I have a little business for that, I brew my own beer. There's a lot that I'm involved in. So the faster I can get away from having to work so many hours at work and put more energy into stuff like this, the better. Um, but eventually, uh, whoever contributes to my Patreon account will get a free uh, copy of this PDF that will be constantly updated. So my goal is to grow this into a living document that I constantly update and that other DMs can use to run a kick-ass uh, sandbox campaign for their players. That's easy to remember and easy to operate. So that's my goal. Um, this has been another uh, chapter in the setting building, fifth edition setting building guide. Thank you everyone for for showing up, for joining me and for putting up with my rambling and generally unfocused nature uh next week uh next week we're gonna talk a little bit more about the island and the setting itself the basis for everything the history a little bit of the layout and why i designed the island in a specific way to generate long-term play for my players because again the goal here is to make as hey quiet is to make as much content as possible with as little effort mm -hmm. and give the players the ability to um, spend a long time years even delving out into the wilderness interacting with the nobility and finding things to do in this world so that's our goal next week same time 10 a.m tuesday as long as things don't go weird keep an eye on my twitter you can find my twitter at the bottom of the page uh follow that for updates when i'm going live um on this or anything else please drop that follow we are 84 of 100 followers on our way to 100 we're going to do a special marathon all day stream once we hit 100 and if you like what you see and you want to support the stream drop that subscription get access to the blue goat bard love emoji i highly appreciate it everything that you do goes directly back into the stream so thank you for your continued support and we will see you later this evening with our first Horror You to Sleep featuring, uh, who goes there, I believe, an ancient sci-fi horror story uh, that The Thing was based off of. So, see you later tonight, 9.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Y'all have a good night.
Bye-bye.